All right, Matthew, welcome back for 2021 to episode 73 of the Performers Advantage podcast, where we bring sports science to the people. With myself, Dr. Will O'Connor, and Dr. Matt Miller, sports scientist. Dr. Will and I live and breathe sports science. We've been in the field for most of our lives, and we work with athletes on the daily, and we love pushing the envelope with what we can do with science and how we can help athletes to improve. That's right, and we started this podcast to help fill the void, the knowledge void between the everyday athlete and the sports science professionals and what's happening out there in the publications, in the labs, and relaying that to you in hopefully an understandable and enjoyable way. All right, Matthew, so we are releasing these Power Meter courses, mountain biking with power, running with power, the fundamentals, kind of like a how-to guide to get you set up, to get you started understanding all the basics the sports science so you can train more effectively we've seen essentially like this massive gap in understanding um, just from putting out the ads people saying why do like why would i mountain bike with a power meter you know what <laughs> like is running power even there yet how does it compare yeah. to cycling so it's so misunderstood it is the, there's yep. a huge knowledge gap that and that's what we're trying to fill so cycling power meters people get it they didn't at first, right? Like 20 years ago when power meters first came out, no one was using them. Like, oh, my heart rate monitor is fine. Now we're seeing like the same thing with mountain biking and with running because running such an old school sport. Yep, that's right. So and we want to fill that gap. Yeah. Cycling, it's just, it's the gold standard, right? Now you, you want to get your like real good race bike. It's coming with a power meter already on it. Like Shimano Specialized, like the they're just putting them in there so anyway this one we are doing running with power all right matt so running with power a lot of people are gonna think what what is it and why do i need it like for running we have pace and pace has been awesome for like up until now really up until like we had this new power metric even heart rate came in but the reliability of heart rate and some of the slow components um, of heart rate have led to a bit of a downfall and a bit of a gap in terms of being able to accurately determine training stress and pacing strategies for running so for runners how many runners do you know that use a power or a heart rate monitors heart rate monitors are oh, that default now like, okay. and if you're getting a, a running watch, it's got a um, near infrared spectrometer, NERS. Um, so just wrist-based heart rate, right? That's okay. are that's they accurate enough to use with running? They uh, don't really work that good in mountain biking. No, because the wind gets under them, your like hands cool and stuff, and it's hard to get a direct line of contact. They require complete darkness in order to get a like direct fix on the vein to measure the pulse rate now for running if you're just doing like your aerobic steady state exercise they're fine it's easy ish you know to get a fix um then you come to like is your watch too big for your wrist are you wearing it tight enough are you a heavy sweater is have you got cold <laughs> hands like uh so there are quite a number of variables that are going to cause wrist-based heart rate to be inaccurate um, and so then we have heart rate straps, which like Matt, you're so that solves the, some issues, right? Still some but issues, doesn't... but these days very reliable. Like, um, the main issue I see two issues I see, are obviously battery related. Um, so, you know, you get a flat battery and it doesn't connect properly. The other one is when you're wearing like, um, some t-shirts, that have like some kind of conductive component to the material uh, or your camelback or you know like a running pack uh, and that picks up some kind of causes a friction based electrical charge and your heart rate strap picks up your cadence so and that is quite common on downhills um, and same with wrist based heart rate on downhills which I think is like a, a blood shunting situation but anyway if anyone's out there has started their run and they're thinking why is my heart rate like 160 170 like just straight off the bat 
generally you can like post analysis have a check look at your cadence and it will be like quite aligned to your cadence because oh. it's picking up that same up and down movement so okay yeah that's <laughs> okay so there's a few issues off the bat with like you know running hard we don't actually have those same issues in cycling or mountain biking but we do have the issue of like I guess like sometimes a person's vest will like flap and like tap on the heart rate strap and blow the numbers through the door. Yeah. So we have that issue. But I guess like the real issue with heart rate is this time delay that the heart rate doesn't always represent exactly what we're doing. Yeah, that's right. And we'll get into that. But first, we should probably like say what running power is. And okay. so we can... Yeah, get that comparison of why it's better. So okay. running power is a way in which we can give a best representation of the amount of work you are doing as a runner at any given time. Now, why is this important? This is important when we think the best analogy example is running uphill. Okay, so you've got a heart rate monitor. You've got your GPS watch. Now you're heading up a hill. And Matt, I've said one minute zone four hill interval. How are you going to know what zone four is? Well, if this is the old me, I'm just going to go pretty much all out until my heart rate gets up to uh, the working zone, which is probably um, by the end if I pace it right, but... That doesn't sound right, so I'm going to go all out and get my heart rate up as quickly as possible. Basically sprint from the go. You essentially have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, um, so, but if you know the amount of work you're doing, and that is uh, energy, like the amount of energy it's requiring you to run up that hill, and you know your threshold in terms of, like, your maximal sustained capacity to generate work you can work out percentages of that now for the bikers or triathletes listening this is common knowledge like especially triathletes who just need to time trial for an ironman half ironman 40k plus and it's like okay well i know i've done my power test right and i know i can ride for 80 to 85 percent for two hours it's kind of like a given. Um, so do runners a, not generally have that outside of heart rate? Like, do you not go by zones? Would you go just off of pace all the time? Is that kind of how it's traditionally done? Yes, okay. pretty much. Like, uh, the default for the majority of runners is going to be pace. So they are going to probably, when you start running, have little idea about zones or strategies or training methodology in terms of like zones and like percentage of thresholds or anything so what you do when you start Matt is you do some kind of race probably like a park run or a 10k or something you go okay well I want to run faster than that so I'll run there or thereabouts for 30 minutes to an hour or I'll try to do my 10k loop, 8k loop, um, sort of five, six miles. And I'll just try and go faster every single time. Mm. Right. And that's a whole nother kind of topic, which we've talked about, like in, um, our fundamentals of sports science course and like the other 72 episodes. But that's because we want Strava to look good, right? Like we, we want our run workout to be representative of our capacity, right? To a continuous like um, uh, feedback loop of you improving or whatever. Um, but we've just had pace. And so now people are, are getting these heart rate monitors inbuilt because before they may or may not have, your watch may or may not have come with a strap. And so then you might have gone, Actually, or some people just go, I can, how high can I hold my heart rate for this whole hour? Oh, no. Um, and uh, like, what is, like, I, I'm going to try to get a new max heart rate. Others kind of knew, like, if I can run this loop at a lower heart rate, 
at the same pace, that's better. But still trying to, it's still pace based, right? So they're still trying to do their sub one hour loop, but just hopefully have a lower heart rate, right? So it's, um, okay. you know, still the understanding of like how to use it isn't, isn't there. Like there's no, you know, when, when you come into cycling, Matt, you'd say if you get a power meter, there are books and books and blogs and resources, cal- online calculators where you know that you have to go do some kind of test and then you work to different percentages of that test, right? Yeah, yeah, right away. Like you're pretty much born into riding a bike and understanding the difference of zones, right? But I, by the sounds of it, by the time you get to the point of needing to understand zones like you're quite into your running by the time you get there because you would have gone beyond using just pace to train and you would have at least been using a heart rate monitor and then you would have started to notice that maybe the heart rate monitor isn't the best way to train and there's probably something better and that's power so you'd be quite into it by that point oh for sure like you have to be very into your data and monitoring your training which is definitely happening more as a trend i'm seeing in running with the likes of strava introducing more tracking analytics like although horrible (laughs) they're still there and people like to reference them and ask me about them so that's where i know right like that these things are being picked up and then i work with you know an array of athletes and we all use training peaks and so they talk to their friends on their runs and and so then people start to to follow these trends and the holes in those tracking analytics start to become very apparent the more you start to use them right so matt you know when you have your your pace threshold which is pretty common um 5k or 10k kind of time is where you're going to be able to predict it so when we say threshold we're kind of thinking 45 minutes to an hour your capacity like what what pace could you hold like what kind of output could you produce for that amount of time it's kind of your aerobic threshold so a measure of really overall fitness and uh, a key performance indicator so we We can use generally like a a 5 or a 10K and what most often happens is you use Regal Factor, which is just an 8% decay for calculating your time, your predicted time and distances beyond 5 or 10Ks, right? I want to run a marathon, Matt. Okay, what's your 5K time? What's your 10K time? Great. Okay, what's... 8%, 8%, if you slowed 8% across the next 30 Ks for the marathon, your predicted time would be this. So that that's generally just what most people use. You go, okay, well, that's my marathon time. And then I can now use my marathon predicted time, which is represented in pace. And I can use my half marathon predicted time, which is represented in pace. And I'm going to train around that. So I want to run a marathon. Well, you need a, you know, I want to run a three-hour marathon. We're going to need to run, you know, whatever it is, the four seventeens or something. In your training, that's kind of how you do it. Now, if I send you, you know, we live in Rotorua. A lot of people train in the forest. There's not a lot of flat area around here. Gravel roads, very undulating. A lot of people live in other undulating areas. It's never like dead flat. And I say go run ten k's, six miles at at marathon pace and you just happen to have a couple of you know you maybe get 200 meters of elevation in there that's very different yeah right but because to go up that hill you have to go really hard to maintain marathon pace because of all the gravity that you're fighting that's right that's right you're going to be not very good yeah so you're having to work generate like a lot more energy output a lot more energy to run up that hill at your marathon pace than you are on the flat and then you are running down the other side of the hill 
and so to get a representation we can try and you of like how hard that effort actually was um, we could look at heart rate okay but then again what if it was super hot and you had caffeine so now your you know your heart rate's five beats higher than it normally would which is five beats closer to the threshold so the goal was to run at 80 percent but now you're at 85 percent of your threshold but you actually weren't working any harder than that you know based off of your heart rate then based off your pace matt you're a bit tired it's a bit hilly so rather than being at like 417s you're at 430s for that 10k okay well now you're further away from your threshold so rather than being at you know 80 percent you're at 75 so you're like oh 75 of of your threshold for um for 10ks well that's nowhere near as challenging as 80 percent right and then if we look at heart rate well 85 percent is way more challenging than mm, and yeah. you're like well what what am i looking at here that's where now we have this new metric of power which is going to give you an indication of an output like the amount of work you're doing from start to finish so that you're fighting gravity you weigh matt like 51 kilos <laughs> and you're running this fast you're running up a hill this gradient and you're spending this much time moving up and moving forward in terms of vertical oscillation ground contact time stride length we take all of those variables put them through an algorithm and very reliably tell you how much energy you're doing how much work you're doing now you've had a lot of experience at this so if you could kind of explain work this is actually one of my favorite things to talk about is work and power and when i was explaining this to my sports science students i wanted to make it really simple to kind of understand super beginner physics so I always give funny examples in my lectures, and this lecture on introductory physics was about fish. So there was fish things in every kind of part of the lecture. And when it came time to describe power, I was talking about how I was fishing, and I caught a fish, and I wanted to lift this fish up to take a photo of the fish. All right, so you can imagine me there sitting in the river with this fish, big smile on my face. The fish is in the water, and I want to bring it up about one meter to take a photo. So I know how much the fish weighs. The fish weighs, let's say, well, we're in New Zealand, so the fish weighs two kgs, and we want to lift it one meter. We know gravity, we know the distance, and we know the weight of the fish. We can easily calculate how much work we're doing. And we can relate that very simply to ourselves running up a hill, right? So I know how much you weigh, I know how tall you are, I know how big the hill is, I know how much work it's going to take to get you up that hill. So whether you walk or whether you run, it's always going to be the same amount of work to go up this same hill as it is whether I lift this fish up very fast or very slow. Same weight, same gravity, same distance, same amount of work, same amount of energy. So work and energy are kind of the same thing. So then what we want, can work out from that is power. So you can imagine if I lift this fish up really, really slowly, it might be really, really easy for me to do that. But if I lift it up really fast, that's much harder. So the power is actually higher because we've reduced the time that it takes to lift that fish up. So power, to calculate power, that's work divided by time. So if I take that same hill that you're running up and you do it much more quickly, you have less time doing the same amount of work, your power is going to be much higher. Now you can imagine if you're walking up a really long hill, doing this uh, massive amount of work, walking up a mountain. Um, you can imagine that if you walk that, that's going to be quite easy. But if you run that and you reduce the time it takes you to get up that hill, your power is going to be much higher, and we can imagine how much more difficult that effort would feel. So power is better representative of how much... Uh, so the amount of time that we do that work in is much more easy to relate to the energy systems that we're using. Uh, when we're doing those efforts whether i'm lifting a fish or walking or running up a mountain that's right and now knowing that okay 
I'm Will O'Connor. I want to run up this one kilometer hill. I know that if I go slowly, it's going to take the same me, Will O'Connor, the same amount of work. Like I've got to move myself up that one kilometer regardless. If I do it faster, my time is reduced, but my work is in my, um, my power has increased. Once we have this power number, I can then do a workout on the flat. So, you know, just dead flat. And that's where pace is very representative because the variables are consistent from a flat road to a flat road. The one kind of difference would maybe be wind, but wind is not hugely impactful on like a, a runner because we're we're moving at such slow speeds. So once I so if I do uh, like a flat park run, I can have uh, or I do my power test on a flat track. I can have a look at what is this power number relative to my speed. So now I'm going to do a half marathon, a trail half marathon, or even just like a half marathon that's that's really hilly. It's got a lot of climbs in it. And I know through maybe past performances that I can run, you know, just over 110, which is around 320 to 330 minutes per kilometer. The my heart rate, who knows? Honestly, when I'm working at threshold or a bit above the conditions, how I'm feeling, like it can be so like five beats, ten beats, I could get to threshold super quickly, like within ten minutes, or it could take thirty minutes. It really just depends on how well I've hydrated, um, yeah, the conditions and what I've had for breakfast, like there's a lot of factors that are going to influence my heart rate around that threshold when we're talking about sub-threshold zone one, zone two, not so much. But in that, I can't reliably look at it. And then I know pace. I know that I could, yeah, I should be aiming for, you know, this this race has got hills in it, so it's probably going to be, I don't know, like an hour 20, not like an hour 10, hour 13. Well, then how do I run those hills? Like I can't reliably look at my heart rate, especially not at the start. Like it could be super low. Um, so now I have this number where, okay, I should, I can't, it's going to be a little longer than 110. So I can't really run 320s. Should be able to run equivalent of like a 335. I now know that power number. Okay, so let's say that's 300 watts. So I know when I get to the hill, I'm running 300 watts. And when I'm heading up that hill at 300 watts, I know this is the equivalent as if I was running a 335 pace, which I know I can sustain through my tests and my experiments. And then, like, that's kind of as you're new to power. And then as you start to get more um, data and more used to understanding the power number and how it works and how it works and relates for you, you can then start to like kind of forget about pace, right? But it's still going to be the end goal. You know, your end goal for a marathon or anything in running is not like, I'm going to hopefully hold 302 watts because no one cares. No one cares. Everyone cares about your time and your time is... But that's, that's how you get to your time though, right? It is. It's exactly right. But you still need to have that reference point. Right? Okay, so I want to run under 120. Okay, well, what's that going to take? What's well, going to take a, a 340? Oh, okay. Well, have you ever been able to hold, you know, the work equivalent of 340? Like, oh, nah, not on. Like, you know, because like you're saying, once we find out that number, that power number, our threshold, and the rate at which we do work, which is power, we have a better representation of how that's affecting our energy systems. So if we kind of circle it back then to the example that you used in the beginning, where you were doing one minute efforts at zone four, what we can then do is we can use, so when you have a targeted session in say zone four, there's a, there's a reason behind it, right? And so zone four, if you guys use the same kind of zones that we're using in um, cycling and mountain biking, Zone four is your 
sub threshold zone that you're doing to be able to um, lift your threshold so you can have longer, greater endurance and at a, a hard uh, aerobic rate, right? So we would do those zone four efforts. And now when we have that power number, we can do it evenly without a sprint at the start to get our heart rate up. And we can produce a very even power throughout the whole thing. So that way we're uh, directing our training towards one specific energy system because it's the same consistent work rate. Exactly. And because otherwise, if we get to those hill efforts, right, and we maybe have a heart rate target, I actually did these. The reason I bring these up because I, I did them recently, uh, a couple weeks ago. And because I was doing a two to one uh, or one to two work to rest ratio, I was doing one minute and then I was doing two minute. And these were more like zone five or zone five B or zone six, whatever you want to refer to our old training zones podcast. Um, yeah, go back to that one. There's a <laughs> zillion zones. Let's make it easy. <laughs> yeah. So I, I did one minute almost all out, like really hard, monitored my power. Then I recovered for two minutes. My heart rate actually never got I think above kind of 160 something or rather, which um, I averaged, as an example, I averaged 161 for a 10 hour ultra marathon. So if I was just using heart rate, it would look like I barely worked. Okay. And then um, I averaged four minutes per K for these one minutes up this hill. And my threshold is I think it's like 325 so well below okay so if we just then if we're just using those two numbers which is all we all most people have I'm I'm barely doing anything I'm essentially doing a zone two aerobic run so then kind of the next step depends on what software you're using you may have normalized graded pace or gap um, grade adjusted pace so what are those like more complicated pace metrics? Yeah, so that's when the system, uh, whatever you're you're using to monitor your training, uh, so GAP is probably the most common for, for Strava because they love to give that to you ahead of your normal pace because it's going to be faster and it's going to take into account the grade um, or the elevation. Okay, so... If you have a watch with the altimeter, it's possible that it's relatively accurate. Um, but if you have a watch that doesn't have an altimeter, you're trying to use a satellite in space to determine from historical data and like topographs what the gradient of the hill you just ran up for one minute yeah we've tried a lot of this with break ace like measuring gradients like within a few seconds like trying to look at how the gradient changes and this is a super accurate gps that measures and reports 10 times a second so our garments and other things like that aren't measuring that many times using the same satellites and let me tell you even the really really good ones that are huge um gps units are also quite poor at measuring elevation but what about speed then is speed quite accurate with the gps because that's then used to calculate power isn't it it depends what power meter you have so anyway like so yeah we have those two metrics and then we have um, maybe grade adjusted pace normalized graded pace whatever which is better okay it's going to give you a better representation because if i've run up this hill it's 10 percent gradient i ran for a minute i covered whatever 300 meters and and now it's going to say, okay, that was like equivalent to maybe your threshold. Then, so from there, now we have power. Okay. And so within this power number, I use a stride and that's what I would recommend. So this is a foot based pod. Um, some people may un, um, remember the like Garmin foot pods, which help with like measure your cadence more accurately and could help with pace more accurately on the trails this is especially true when like gps's used to really really be horrible and and they had no accelerometers in them so they couldn't 
measure your cadence or anything. And their system, their hardware and their software, so like their, their algorithm, takes into account your altimeter, the altimeter built in, and your foot's movement through three-dimensional space. So after modeling thousands of running strides and movements, they're able to accurately calculate your speed through displacement, through the the um, accelerometers, through space and time, right? And then you've got to input your weight and height. So once you know that, you can, you that's, you know, those are important variables in terms of calculating work. Because if we don't know, if we don't know weight or mass, we, we don't know work, um, Right, so so, so, so I that's, guess the GPS so that's how they're able to do that. The GPS reliability, though, isn't super important when it comes to power meters, is it? No, not for the stride. But when you're using something like, um, so I have a Coros watch, Coros Apex, and Coros have introduced running power native to their wrist watches. Okay, so those, as far as I understand, require uh, input of speed. Okay, or pace, movement, distance, time, movement. Um, so that's going to be from the GPS. And Garmin, which uses the uh, power meter based within the heart rate strap, um, they also have like this pod that you can clip onto your shorts. I don't know if they still if they're still supporting that. Again, they require. They're not. Um, calculating their own speed and distance uh, from from like the the hardware itself like the chest strap they're taking it from a gps so what i've noticed from those is if you're just like with a lot of things like if you're out in the open running on a flat road with like not a lot of twists or turns and really open it's great it's fine but it's when you start to incorporate really steep uphills a bit of you know, um, building cover, tree cover, forest, um, super steep stuff, super sharp downhills, it starts to, like, not be so accurate. Um, I can't speak to Polar, which uses the same wrist-based, just GPS unit, um, or Runscribe, which is actually two foot pods. Sounds complicated. <laughs> yeah, and that's where the state of the industry is in terms of running power. Like Matt, you were an early adopter of cycling power and it was the same thing. There was the hubs, there was the cranks and there was the spiders. Well, there still is, there's pedals and, and everything. And now we're at the point where in cycling, it doesn't really matter where you're reading it from. Okay, it's, it's you did you did the study. Okay, you compared all these different kind of points of measurement and they're all reliable within themselves maybe not directly comparable but they're going to give you the best indication of the amount of work you're doing so in the initial sense yeah you like you just need that number and they're not that expensive are they you know i think but you know if we got to this point like we're obviously thinking about running power and we go really in depth into like how to use it set it up get going all those things um you know we have the, the three different modules in our running power meter course to get you started, get you using it, get you up training and get you rolling with your power meter. So it's not a huge investment by the time you are interested in power to actually make the, the purchase and get rolling. Is it like, how much do they go for these days? Um, it's interesting you say that because runners are used to spending nothing. <laughs> oh, okay. Right. So uh, it's 280 dollars us real dollars um okay. which is like when you're thinking if you're coming from triathlon or cycling is nothing there's two there's two <laughs> like pairs of tires, tires. <laughs> yeah it's it's real it's like your bike service it's it's nothing um but when the running world has been blown away by like 200 dollar carbon plated running shoes and thinking, are they worth it? Should I get them? 
like that's a discussion point of shoes that wow. have broken the world records like numerous times in the last two years and people are still wondering if they should fork out the money um it's yeah <laughs> it's expensive um but it's not for what you get it's it's an incredible and this is the stride i should say uh so if you were going to get a heart rate based one a heart rate based power meter um from garmin then you're looking at in real dollars us dollars like 50 to 70 is that uh, it and oh yeah power wow okay so obviously the price isn't a big barrier like there's some psychology no, if you're going at the on point there. where you want it, it i don't think it's, it's like that restrictive it's not like a set of carbon wheels or even a, a cycling power meter which is going to be 1000 plus yeah so i guess what we the main issue then is in running like and this is what we've tried to address in our course and this is the whole point of the sports science podcast like we want to make these things that are going to revolutionize how you train. We want to make these really easy to understand. And from talking to runners, you know, and then from talking to you as a coach to runners, like we know that's actually a huge barrier at the moment is trying to understand like how this $200, whatever investment is going to actually make you faster. It's well worth it, right? So what we need to try and explain and help athletes to understand is okay, this is why it's so good and this is how it's going to help you and this is what you can do to understand it and make use of it. It's, you know, if you think back, Matt, when you had a power meter and what people were saying for cycling, right, it's the, it's the same, like, it's a lack of understanding and education, okay? It's, it's not that... And it's, it's no not one's that, at fault there, right? No, because it's not that power, runners... cycling power meters first came out, there was no, no understanding, no one understood it. You just look at the plot and squiggly lines. And that means nothing to anyone, <laughs> right? It's all about like, okay, what do you do with those squiggly lines, right? Yeah. That's no one's fault. That's just a time thing. Like it takes time for people to yeah. be able to. And another barrier that we've kind of, we, like running power is, well, one is adoption of the technology and two is a comparison to cycling. Okay, which, Matt, I'm quite proud of us because we've come up with the rider independent, runner dependent explanation for how they differ. So this is going to be, for a lot of people, this is the question they ask. So is it just like cycling where I get my number and I just train to that? So fundamentally, yes. However, it's very different in that if Matt brings his bike round to my place and uh, he's just got a new bike and he's like, man, it's, it's so fast. I was like, all right, I'll give you, give you a race over 1K. We'll both use your bike. And he's got a power meter on it. He jumps on, gives it a 1K, gives it all out. I jump on, on his little mini bike and give it, a, give it all out if my knees don't hit the handlebars. And... We can both like grab his, grab his head unit, grab his Garmin, put it in training peaks and have a look who did the most power, what our times and stuff were, right? And because it has a, has a strain gauge, it's, <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> it's going to measure the amount of force or torque applied. Let's just say it's, it's the standard crank base one. Force torque applied to the pedals and there's your cadence. And so that's the, velocity but tight you know and then we have time so we don't need to worry about that too much we get a power number right and we both got it through your bike and it was accurate for both of us and comparable now i have a running power meter bring it around matt check it out just got this new running power meter it's like cool all right i'll race you over 1k and i go run 1k unclip it put it on matt's shoes and he goes runs 1k and we can't compare now because the inputs that were within the algorithm was my weight and my height. Now, if anyone's ever met Matt, he's about half of both of those things. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like we said earlier, the amount of work it's going to take Matt to move that one kilometer is very different than the amount of work it's going to take me 
to move that one kilometer. Because it's dependent on the runner. It's dependent on not only actually the the mass and height, but also there's some other variables in terms of running form. Right, so Matt runs with his arms out wide and his toes pointing out and he lands heel first and overstrides. It's like, like so. a T-Rex, except yeah. <laughs> with clothes on. Yes. So one of those people you see running out on the footpath and you're like, you should choose Walk. to do something else <laughs> <laughs> to lose weight because what you're doing there looks atrocious. Yeah, that's me. Oh, go on. Yeah, we got the visual. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. So you're actually, there's actually now even more dependent on you as a runner as to how much work it's taking you to move that um, that one kilometer because you're you're wasting so much energy, let's say moving up and down or overstriding, you're spending a lot of like your ground contact time. So that's the amount of your stance phase, the amount of time your foot spends on the ground and your stride length, stride rate. Like we have all these things where uh, we can we can look at that. Right, we can look at all these variables because we have this device that measures your displacement through three-dimensional space. And we yeah. have these state of norms, which we can compare these movements to. And now we can like get an incredibly accurate and data-driven representation of, of what you're doing. But it is very individual to you. Yeah, so I think I have a, another example to kind of drive that point home. And that's if we take our bike, my bike, and we both go up the same hill and I wear a backpack that weighs 50 kg. So now we weigh the same weight. We could do that same hill at the same power and get the exact same time. So time and power would be equal, right? But then we take that running and I put a, that same 50 kg backpack on. So now we're the same weight. We could do the same time. Could we do the same power? Uh, depends what the inputs are. So, so we probably, we, so we can do the same power, right? Yeah. But the, the, the actual magic in the data that we're going to get from running is going to be totally different because what we'll see is once we really dig in beyond that power number is we're going to see that I'm spending so much time, like so much, I have so much ground contact time. I don't know how you explain it, right? Like high ground, high ground contact time because what I'm doing is I'm so inefficient. Right. And that's what we can see in the data with that running power meters, all these horrible things that I'm doing. So even though I'm able to run the same pace as you at the same power, I'm doing it all wrong. And that's one of the things that we can see with a running power meter that we can't really see with a cycling power meter. Because if I put that backpack on and we, I go put out the same power as you, I can get there in the same time. And yeah, maybe it was harder for me because I had that backpack on and, you know, my power to weight was just through the roof. But with running, what we're going to be able to see is all these inefficiencies and through all these other metrics. So one of the things that we talked about is like when we talked about this running power number is like, okay, that's your key to then get to all these other really useful metrics that you can then affect in your training beyond just training zones. Exactly right. Like when you're calc like if you're looking at cycling power, it's kind of a fixed efficiency factor. So that is how efficient you are at at pedaling, right? You can be a little crappy, but the crank's fixed to the chain ring, which is fixed to the, you know, the chain drives the cassette, which is on the rear wheel. Like, you can't really stuff that up. No, we know efficiency is important, right? But we can't measure it unless we're actually measuring oxygen uptake. Yeah, whereas, like, when I, if you, (laughs) like, imagine just being able to pedal Willy nilly, like then there'd be, there's no fixed points in running. It's just, just all out there. And we have, now we have like these new fast shoes. We have so many of these, um, like underneath iceberg metrics that actually I think contribute to the lack of adoption in running power. Mm. Right. Because you go, because they're so confusing. Yes. They are so confusing. (laughs) Because yeah. they're not like they haven't existed anywhere. It's taken me, I've been using running power for five years. And in terms of the actual integration 
of my understanding of the metrics to training methodologies across a cohort has taken that five years. It's also taken the development of the people like Stride to better um, reliably measure and display and graph these metrics um, and also introduce new cal- calculations. So one really important one now is like you've essentially, like if we just break it down, you move up and then you move forward when you run. So moving up is kind of like a waste. You're horizontal. Sorry, vertical. Vertical. vertical um, because if you just jumped up and down, like like you said, lifting the fish out of the water, that cr- that's work, but you're not going anywhere. That's, that's not great. If you just moved forward, amazing. But you need to move up and forward. And so kind of you can have a look at your how much you know, your work you're doing up and how much you're moving forward, you can kind of divide those to get a form power ratio. And that's like a really good method of efficiency. But that didn't used to exist. Like this is a very new metric that they've been able to introduce because, and by itself it doesn't really work well, but now we have like this larger cohort, like this larger user base of data to get this table of norms established. So you know, okay, well, I'm 23% form power ratio. Great, that's that's about average. Now to getting to find resources or coaches that understand how then to improve that number. Different story. It's not like cycling where you can say, okay, Matt, I do 300 watts. Okay. Well, we need to make that relative. What's your watts per kg? Okay, your power to weight ratio. Oh, wow. It's really good. Okay, well, how do I get it up? Okay, well, why don't we do a one minute and a 10 minute? Oh, wow, your one minute's really poor and your 10 minute's amazing. They're really, like, they're too close together, which means um, your anaerobic capacity is probably pretty weak. We can work on a bit of strength. You're going to do um, a, a block of, you know, these one one minute intervals with um, one to two work to rest ratio at 100 to 110 to 120 percent. Boom! Like you're giving away all the secrets, <laughs> my man. So, <laughs> but see how easily I did that. Yeah. Right. Whereas I can go, okay, what's your running form power? Okay, cool. What's your what's your stance time, stride length, and leg spring stiffness? Wait, why? <laughs> <laughs> Like, and you're like, like oh, uh, I'm, I don't know. I read it in a blog somewhere. <laughs> okay. Like, you. I know I've... you've been looking at this a lot, right? So you, because, you know, I know you run with power all the time. We did an analysis of your 100K looking at all these new metrics. And, you know, now that we can draw that parallel between cycling power and running power, I think it's a little bit easier to understand. So as you've gotten into it, are there, do you have like three super important, important metrics so we can give people, um, you know, okay, get your running power meter, like use it to set your zones. It's going to be way better. It's going to be way better to train by. Do you have like three favorite metrics to use or something like that? Yeah. Well, I guess if we kind of getting it set up, the first thing I recommend is just to get a running power meter and start using it. So I was actually talking, an athlete was like quizzing me on running power, who I went running with last week. And uh, he was like, okay, after this next marathon that he's training for, I'll get it and um, then I'll start to try and understand it. I don't want to mess up my, my build up. And I said to him, if you get it now, because he has like a half marathon, he has these, all these key workouts in this race, you don't need to look at it. But when you finish that build up and you complete that marathon, you can then look at all of that data and go, well, that was my best race ever. What kind of power was that? What kind of power was I doing in training? How does that look in terms of my training load for running power? What what are all these other metrics? Like what was my ground contact time? What was my power pacing profile? So if you just get it and start using it, you're in a good place to then actually begin to understand it 
because if you try to get it and understand it all at once you, you're going to be too green all your stuff's not going to be relative like you're going to not going to be able to relate it to oh, okay well i remember last year i did this incredible race can't do it so that's it get going and put power on your watch so you have my recommendation is to either have time or distance depending on what you like to look at heart rate pace power when you look at those things you would then start to get an idea of what your power looks like relative to heart rate and pace so for a lot of people they're going to be running zone two it's that's great then once you have your your number that's the first place start your power threshold okay so that's going to be the the will o'connor method of doing a 1k all out and a 5k all out this is like the first time the will o'connor method has become public it is and we spent about four hours debating and discussing <laughs> the scientific and mathematical justification for this method and yep. so, so it works it's tidy and it's easier and better than the other methods that we found so the will o'connor method let's roll with it what do we do 1k and 5k okay so that's going to give you your critical power so you go out and you do a time trial yep so what i'd recommend is 5k is super easy to come by and they're very reproducible for like the course because park run now our us listeners um may not be super familiar with park run um because it's mainly kind of a like european asian pacific uh but that's a a free 5k timed run every saturday at 8 a.m um so in the us you'll have something similar there's, there's 5k always, races all the time in yeah, the US. There's always some kind of series, the summer series or something like that. Like it's and it's even pretty easy to push yourself for a, for a 5k. Okay, we it's a it's a stand it's a gold standard across like measuring your performance. So the 5k, find a race, do it. That's going to be like your benchmark reproducible race that you that you want to do every time. Then a a 1k measure it out on the on the road um maybe go to an athletics track if there's one nearby and just just go go hammer and tongs and just uh find out what you can do for for 1k and what that allows us to do is plot two points on a graph calculate a curve and that gives you your critical power which is the asthmatote so if you can kind of visualize those two points right if um distance is along the the axis the x-axis y-axis is power output you know right at the beginning for 1k there's going to be this really high power output later on at 5k along the x-axis is going to be quite a bit lower power output and then we kind of draw this curve starting at the top point and moving down swinging around hopefully i'm making this i this think this, this one will be better if we can direct our listeners to the blog and the calculator for the Will O'Connor method. So you can just put yeah. in your 1K time, or sorry, your 1K power and your 5K power, and then we can calculate your critical power for you. Yeah. And so essentially that plateaus, that curve. Like it doesn't drop to the point of zero. And that point at which it plateaus is your aerobic threshold. And once we know that we can work out the percentages from that but yeah do that do that test find that number start playing around with working at different percentages because then the next number um and this is actually going to be more for um stride users which most running power users are is form power and form power ratio so this is the amount of quote unquote lost energy. So Matt, you have break ace and you're measuring power, right? But it's not good power, it's breaking power. <laughs> it's the amount of like energy you're taking away from your like forwards momentum. So it's kind yeah. of counterintuitive. It's all the energy you're wasting. 
Yep. This is the same power number. Form power is the amount of power you're, race, you're wasting. And then you have the form power ratio. So that is like a ratio of how much power you're wasting relative to how much you're actually producing, which is giving you an indication of how you're moving forward. Those are the numbers. Right, well, those are the three things. Where So you want to collect all your data from before you even want to start thinking about it. Then you want to establish your threshold. And then you want to establish your form power so you can start to have a look at not only your form power um, at one specific point, like a race, but actually across different dis- like different intensities or different zones, right? Marathon, half marathon, 10K, 5K. And you go, hey, look, I am super, super efficient when I'm running slow, but as soon as I start to try and go fast, I'm like, I'm just like wasting, I'm losing all this like power somehow, like my, my form power ratio is really getting out of whack. Once you understand that, you can say, okay, I'm going to start working on these different things. I'll ask someone to look at it. And from there, Matt, it's Pandora's box. You start looking at all the other metrics. It's such a rabbit hole, isn't it? Because there's so many things that you can look at. Uh, and I think, you know, the bite size approach is pretty good, right? So you get it, get your power meter, you do the Will O'Connor method, you get your thresholds. Then you start digging into the other things. But I think you should spend some time understanding your thresholds, how your, you, how your heart rate responds to different power outputs when you're, say, going up a hill, going down a hill, going on flat. Give yourself some time to understand that first before you get in down the rabbit hole because it can get kind of overwhelming. And we don't want that to happen. We see that with power meters still, too. Like We don't want someone to get overwhelmed by looking at a bunch of squiggly lines on a graph want to make it real easy and once you understand what's happening and how your body's responding to these different power outputs then you can start to look at those metrics that you find really really important yeah so i'll tell you like how i got started um so yeah i established my threshold okay so i did um i didn't do the will o'connor method at the time it had not yet been established but i established my threshold and then i just started having a look at um what percentages of my threshold I kind of should be doing for like a park run or like a a tempo run okay and then I'd have a look at what uh what that actually represented like okay yep so that you know that um 5k effort or that marathon effort felt pretty rubbish and then I'd look at my number my power and like oh well that was 87%. I was actually like thinking 85 was more like indicative of what I'd do. Oh, I guess like I did go up that hill right at the start. I didn't really think about that. And that, and then do another 5K like somewhere else or a, a race somewhere else, right? And then, then you did previously and you do a slower time and you, you know, but close, right? And then you can look at the power and, oh, oh, well, that course was actually a little harder. You know, there was a bit more twists and turns. There was more, a bit more slowing down and speeding up. And it actually meant that, yeah, I, I generated the same amount of power. And then then you take that next step where you go, oh, man, I, that 5K, I was like 10, 20 seconds off, off my time. My power is like the same as the like when I did a really good time. Oh, but my form power ratio is off like obviously i'm a bit tired and i lost form you know and um same thing with pacing right because you might have kind of a an out and back course and it's downhill at the start then uphill on the way back you can again look at your power and get get these numbers to to start to uh, hopefully um, it's kind of a great basic introduction just to looking at it. No different than you would look at your pace. How did I pace that run? Okay, I did four minute, four minute, four thirty, five minute. Crap. <laughs> you know that was rubbish. It's just how did I do last time I did my PB? Four fifteen, four fifteen, four fifteen, four ten. Amazing. Okay, it's just that it's the same thing. You just use like you just got this new number 
that is going to be more representative of the amount of like actual work you're doing. Yeah, so I think we'll probably leave it there, Matt. We're going to be, after this course, we're releasing the advanced metrics for running power. Um, sort of like, so it's the next step beyond this course. But I think as we stand, this course, running with power, the fundamentals of running with power, how to get set up, get started, is a more step-by-step -step guide of what we've covered in this podcast. And I'm also producing like a lot of blogs, and videos around my experiences and helping you guys to get started in this understanding um, because there are, yeah, there's a lot. There's a yeah, lot out there. It's a rabbit hole. Yeah, cool. So I, I guess you can also help people to understand some of the metrics that they're seeing as well so they can get in touch with you to just have a look at their data and help to implement training interventions to help them improve the weaknesses that they have. That's right. Like I've been able to sit down with like, a coach and an athlete just to help them integrate running power into like their coaching athlete like program like a regime whatever you want to call it campaign um so it's not like i just want to coach everyone it's just it's if you're not quite sure about something it's probably worth reaching out to someone who knows if there is someone like locally or me book a time figure it all out get yourself set up and then that's just going to like save time. So just jump on uh, the Performers Advantage podcast website or drwilloconnor.com and uh, social media. I don't know. We're available everywhere, YouTube, Matt. Twitter, TikTok. LinkedIn. They'll find you. All right, Matt. Till next time. Thanks, Will. See ya.